Lifestyle Pirates with Big J and Adriano. Okay, good morning, everybody. Welcome to this episode of Lifestyle Pirates. We are joined this morning by Nicole Webb, the author of The China Blonde. Good morning, Nicole. Welcome. Good morning. Welcome to the show. Thank you. How it's good doing? to be here. I'm doing well for a Saturday morning. Yeah. Mm. Well, well, thank you very much for, for taking up your time. Um, how long have you been back in Australia? Just over a year now? Um, yeah, actually, no, four years. Four years. Four you've been back. years. It feels like a year. Um, but Last year went forever. Yeah, last year was about five years. And yeah, I think when you come back from overseas, um, it just takes so long to get settled. Mm -hmm. You think it would be easier sort of coming back as opposed to going somewhere as an expat. Mm -hmm. But when you go somewhere, everything's sort of set up for you and you've got all of that help. Whereas when you come home, it's like you're just kind of left in the lurch. So, you know, you've got to get Medicare cards and check your driver's licenses up to date. Do you even have bank accounts that operate anymore? Mm. You know, um, and all that stuff. And then they want an address and you're like, well, I don't live anywhere at the moment. I'm in an Airbnb and it's mm. just, it goes on forever. And we were buying a house and selling an apartment and James had his new job and trying to get Ava into school. And I feel like that was two years yeah. just to get that set. And then, you know, then you catch up with everyone and that takes about two years. I still haven't caught up with some people, you know, well, still waiting. For, for those of you that haven't caught up with, we got her first, okay? Yeah. yeah. Right. So you've been actually, Sorry. you've been fairly transient. I mean, you're originally from New Zealand? Yes. Um, born in New Zealand, in Auckland, and we came across the ditch in uh, 1989. So I was a teenager not giving away my age, but <laughs> um, I was kicking and screaming. I didn't really want to come, you know, when you're in yeah. that age 16 and, you know, you don't want to leave all your friends. But um, the sunshine and the surf was beckoning us. So um, we, yeah, I came with mum and dad and my grandparents were here and never looked back. You know, when you say you're going to go somewhere for two years and yeah. it turns out to be, you know, 22 or something. Yeah. So, yeah. And so what, what brought you over in the first place? I think mum and dad just came and um, – Back then, I think this was more seen as the land of opportunity. Okay. You know, Australia was a lot cheaper back then than New Zealand and mm. even, you know, um, there were just more opportunities. Yeah. And the climate, I think, you know, in New Zealand it's a bit wet and Cold. windy. Yeah. So it just seemed, you know, surface paradise was like, wow, yeah. <laughs> it's a place to be. Yeah. That's so is so, Australia home? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. For sure. I mean, I, I'd still have that New Zealand, but yeah, I mean, I've lived here longer than I ever lived in New Zealand. Yeah, that's you know, right. I love New Zealand and I'll always be, I've got a bit of a, you know, attachment and I've still got a family there. Um, but this is home. This is what I know. Are you conflicted in the rugby matches? Yeah. <laughs> I always feel myself as soon as the hucker comes on, I'm like, yeah, yeah I'm a Kiwi. Yeah. yeah. You know, but I probably know more about the Aussie team. So yeah. yeah. Excellent. Yeah. And you, you did, you've done most of your career as, as a journo. You, you kind of fell into Sky News and... Were, yeah, were well, I kind of, out? well, I didn't really fall into it. I wanted to be a journalist from, you know, since I was at high school. I mean, I really wanted to go to Hollywood, but they told me I couldn't act or sing. So that was off the cards. <laughs> so she's like, don't you, you know, what about a journalist? And I'm like, oh yeah. And, you know, I'd always had admired the TV sort of presenters. So I kind of just set my sights on that and went to uni after school, did journalism and couldn't get a job when I finished uni. You know, blonde young things were like a dime a dozen wanting to be on camera. So I was like, you, you look too young, you sound too young, just we need men, boys. Mm. Uh, so I did a lot of work experience for free and, you know, made coffee and that. And then I got offered a job in sales in a radio station uh, in Rockhampton up in Queensland. So I'd been up there for university. So I went back and did that. They plonked the phone book in front of me and said, here's your client list go from there. So, I, you know, um, so I did that for a couple of years and I still wanted to be a journalist, got offered a job by the local TV station, thought, well, that's TV, step in the right direction. Yeah. Went across to that. Um, that was a lot harder. Um, just still wasn't happy and decided, okay, I, I really need to pursue this whole journalism thing. And I got the guy that used to make the ads to make me a little show reel um, with me sort of here I am standing up here, you know, all very important. And then I would 
send it to every single like newsroom in the country mm. begging. And then in my lunch hours when I was in sales, I would drive to the car, this sort of lone car park and sit there and ring all these news directors and say, hey, have you got a job? And they'd be like, no, no, but keep trying. <laughs> and then I decided I'd have, you know, that calling wasn't enough. I needed to drive around the country. <laughs> I was 22 and stop at all of these newsrooms. Yeah. So I started in Rockhampton and my parents had moved to Melbourne. So I decided to quit my job and move down there and give myself a year to become a journalist. So here I was off in my little maroon Mitsubishi driving from Rocky to Melbourne, which was, you know, that's how many hours? It's a big 20, distance. 30 hours. Um, and I just stopped at all these little country towns and had made appointments with the news directors, went in. Here I was, this blonde thing with this big long hair and lavender suit, and I'd be like, you know, can I have a job? And quite intimidating for me, but um, nothing was got happening. And I went to Melbourne, ended up doing customer service in ANZ Bank on the phones, you know, can I help you? <laughs> What's your bank details? And then I think uh, I gave myself a year and the year almost ended and a news director from Newcastle rang me and said, you are the perfect example of persistence pays off. Would you like a journalism job in Tamworth, New South Wales at MBN Television? I was like, yes, please. Yeah. And off I went from Melbourne, drove up there and so it began. Excellent. Well, then, yeah. what's the nightlife like? Oh, <laughs> it's all happening. Yeah. Uh, there's a there's a lot of pubs. Yeah. There's a pub on every corner. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, country music festival. Yeah, it was pretty good. I was there for two years, but you know those small towns, you kind of love it for the first couple of years because you just everyone knows everyone and mm -hmm. everyone's always at the same pub, and it was good fun. But then you get to the point where you're like, okay, I can't really even go to the supermarket without bumping into someone. Yeah. So it's time to go. Yeah. And did it? Did it fulfil what you wanted it to fulfil? Was it what you expected? Yeah, it was. It was. Um, I I mean, look, the, the stories were like, you know, the big tomato competition <laughs> and, you know, the local council stories. and But then, you know, there was a double murder-suicide would happen and that was big news. And so there were stories. You know, you really cut your teeth, I guess, as a journo yep. because we had to do everything. Um, you know, you would kind of stand up there in the morning. There were two journos news journos and one sport guy and two cameramen. It was like a bureau basically. And you'd sort of toss a coin for who did what stories and then off you'd go with a cameraman for the day. And you sort of had to travel quite far because you weren't just doing Tamworth, mm. you were doing the whole region, you know, so that encompassed a lot of country towns. And so you'd be gone for the day and do maybe three stories, come back quickly, write them up, voice them in the edit suite. And then the editor would cut your pictures and you'd maybe do a stand up somewhere and send them back down the line to Newcastle and then they'd be played out that night. So it was really good learning curve. I loved it, you mm. know, yeah. And then so did you just then kind of get closer and closer to the big cities? Did that um, yeah, to I went to the Gold Coast because uh, my parents had moved back to the Gold Coast by this point and I thought I want to be with them and then they moved away again so clearly they didn't want to be with me. Yeah. <laughs> Rude. <laughs> um, so I... Yeah, I went and I, there was just a one-man band up there. So it was me and a cameraman, but also Channel 9 was up there. So I did a lot of stories for them. And I still had that thing. I wanted to be a newsreader. And, yeah, decided I had to get to the big smoke, Sydney, mm -hmm. and came down and did a lot of freelance at Seven and SBS and Sky for about a year and then worked out that freelance is not really, you know, stable and making money. I had to get a full-time job. And I got a full-time job at Sky mm -hmm. eventually um, it, on the business show. So that was like a nightly program, half hour. So we worked all day sort of getting stories up for that and then put that together. And, but I wasn't presenting or anything. That came a little bit later with Health News. That was just a little show they did. And I said, can I just do some interviews? So I did a bit of on camera, mm -hmm. kind of got used to it a bit. And then I think I said, can I read that show? And then I got to read. It was not live, so it's pre-recorded. Uh, so that kind of got me into that, getting used to being on camera and all of that. And then eventually I think I got to read the main news, which was live. And back then Sky was very different to what it is now. Um, <laughs> it was, um, you know, just news bulletins one after the other. Yep. Um, and it was breaking news and whatever was happening. Very few. There was a few shows, but not so political as it is now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it was great. You know, you'd either do the the 5 a.m. to midday shift or the midday to 6 or 6 till midnight. And I did that for about five or six years, which was really good. What was it like presenting? 
It's hectic. Mm. It's not as glamorous as it sounds, especially not at Sky. I mean, it was do your own hair, do your own makeup, get in there. You know, you you, you had producers, but you also had to be across everything. Yeah. You know, you had you sort of have to know a little bit about a lot. Yeah. So you you know, and I was quite nervous. It wasn't something that ever came naturally to me. Like even though I thought I wanted to be an actor and all of that, it is not really my happy place. Like yeah. I struggle with being on camera. So it was always. I mean, I used to just have to be sick to the stomach for the first, you know, probably first two years. Yeah. I'd be really stressed out, but then I'd do it and I'd, I'd love it. Do you have a post-show post, post show high? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I would think I've done it. That's so great. You know, I loved doing it, but I was so nervous, like until probably the last couple of years. And then it just becomes like riding a bike and you know that you can do it. You know, if something technical happens and the cameras stop or the auto cue would frequently just drop out and you've just got to make sure you can. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if I'd be able to do it now because I'd need glasses. So I'd be like, can I see what's (laughs) on, you know? Um, And I love the live breaking stuff, but that was kind of, it was scary, you know, Mm -hmm. like the the Black Saturday bushfires or the Mumbai terror attacks back then. And, you know, you're just having things thrown at you. There's no preparation. It's just like, you know, Next up, we've got a phono with a phone interview with, um, you know, the fire brigade chief head down in Victoria or someone, you know, someone who's just lost their house. You know, you're going yeah. to them. There's no questions. You just make it up on the run, sort of thing. And that would just go on and on when there was live news stories because yeah. you're just wanting, you know, whoever you can to talk to. Yeah. So it's but it was often there were two of us doing it. So you have that camaraderie mm-hmm. with that person beside you. I had John Gatfield for a long time. Um, and learnt a lot. Um, yeah, so it, it was fun. It was exciting. Um, and But then there were days when it was just so repetitive where you do six news bulletins and you read the same story every single bulletin yeah. so that you just almost can read it with your eyes closed and nothing's happening. Yeah. Or, you know, you'd read till midnight and you'd be like, oh, my God. You know, I like the night shifts because I'm a night person. Yeah. In the morning shifts you'd feel like a drag queen. <laughs> you'd get all dressed up and you're there at 5 a.m. and it's like, here I am, you know, just <laughs> – Oh oh my God. Yeah. I struggled. I struggled, but yeah. So it was good fun. And I also read the news. I forgot for New Zealand because I am from New Zealand. They needed someone to fill in. We did the prime news back then out of Sky News studios and they wanted someone from New Zealand to fill in on the weekend. So I had to put my accent back on. Seriously, Brilliant. put my accent back on. Can you turn it on? Yeah, I can. When I'm tired, when I'm had a few drinks or yeah. when I'm angry, like it just, I can't help it. It just <laughs> oh, comes out. Angry. Yeah. It's kind of just like your native tongue. It yeah, just yeah. comes out. And I'm like, oh my God. I must admit, if, I get, if I get shouted at by my wife, then the, the, the proper Queenslander comes out. Does right? it? Yeah. yeah. The proper Queenslander <laughs> in a big way. Um, before we get talking about your book, I'm kind of here keen to hear your thoughts around um, the kind of news now. And, and I guess the, the quality, the, the kind of integrity and, and mm. the content now. Because there's, there's obviously we are in a content-rich mm, It's world. crazy, isn't it? I think you can – and you can get content from anywhere mm. and it can be written by anyone. Mm. So it's really hard to get the truth, I think, to know what's real. Mm. Yeah. Um, and I think newsrooms do a good job, but, you know, everything's on Twitter before anything else. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's not – you don't really need Sky News. I guess that's why they've – changed their whole format now to being just political commentating shows yeah. because, um, you know, it was once upon a time it was really wanted because you needed that breaking news. That was the only place you could get it. If yeah. something was happening, you'd go, well, let's put Sky News on because you had to wait till six o'clock for the news. Um, but now it's like I go straight to Twitter or, you know, I know that will have the latest updates or you can punch in a website, whatever. Mm. So the quality, I don't know, I do a lot of freelance freelance writing still, but you do see, I mean, it loses a lot of um, credibility, I guess. It can't help but lose that when people are churning things out, you know, to the minute, really. Yeah. It seems um, to me that we're only talking about COVID now at the moment. We are, aren't we? That's all it's it. Yeah. You turn it on every day. It's just all yeah. we talk about. Yeah. And I do. I remember coming. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Well, I mean, there's only so much you can say, isn't there? Um, And I think um, I remember coming back from Asia, and I had, you know, when you're living overseas, everything takes on more of a global tone, and the news bulletins that I could watch were like CNN or you know something like that. And I remember how parochial it seemed coming back here. The news stories that you would see and how small Australia did seem. 
but then you just get back into it and it becomes your world anyway. The longer you're here, I'm, I switch it on and watch it. And, you know, I said, I'm not watching a current affair, but I do, <laughs> you know, you just get into it. But yeah, mum would always say, you know, did you hear about such and such? And I had no idea what was happening in Australian politics yep. when I came back yeah. because I just was away from it all and you get out of that zone. But yeah, it's different. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. So someone that's, you, you sound like you've been very persistent in your career. You've kind of driven the, the, the journalism side. You've, you've made your way. What mm. took you to, to Hong Kong? Yeah, so I um, met James, my husband, on a blind date. So I had been in relationships for a decade or so and they weren't probably the best relationships for me. Um, and I think I just put a post up this morning actually because I saw myself, um, one of my Facebook pictures was in Africa. I went to volunteer in Africa in 2007. Awesome. And that was kind of the catalyst for me to go, right, you need to really start living and not thinking about what might have been with these people. and you know, you might never get married, you might never have kids, just so you need to really be happy with yourself. Um, so that's when I decided to do that and go overseas. And ironically, I went on this blind date and met James um, just before I went to Africa. And Here in Australia? Yeah, he's, he's English. He's yeah. Idiot. So I... I like him already. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he came along. I remember went to Belmain. We were meeting at this pub and I was like, oh, my God, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? Yeah. I'm never, ever doing this again. It's too nerve-wracking, you know, skull... Uh, glass of shardy or whatever, sit there waiting, waiting. It's raining. I'm like, oh. And then he came along and he was just normal, yeah. just a nice guy. And I was like, wow, normal, that's good. That's a good start. <laughs> and I told him I could have one drink, you know, because I had a funeral the next day, which he thought I was making it up, but I actually did. It was a, a friend from- You already from, worked in your exit show. Yeah, yeah I was like, I'm out. <laughs> but I ended up having dinner next door, so he can't have been too bad. And uh, But I still was like, yeah, that was he was really nice, but I'm off to Africa. See ya. Yeah. And then I came back six weeks later and he was still really nice and he sort of left these nice messages and I just kept thinking, you know, one date and mm. I cut it off there. But he just, you know, he just persisted, I guess, <laughs> and, and he remained nice. And, um, yeah, 11 months later we he proposed. Still nice? Still nice. <laughs> yeah, he's a good guy, 13 years later. Yeah. Um, so, and he's in hotels, as you know, and – they like you to move along and keep progressing a lot in hotels. And he'd said that to me first up about moving overseas and I just straight out said no. Mm. I said I kind of – I felt like I was 35, I'd done my time, I'd missed out on that overseas sort of working life, I thought. Yeah. Um, and I had – you know, I'd worked hard to get to where I was and I was a career girl. Um, but then this job came up in Hong Kong and it was probably a year later and I just had was chatting to mum and – she said, you should just do it. You know, you get one chance at life, you know, and I was pretty bit bored at work anyway. I was on the night shift and I probably lost a bit of my ambition and my mojo. And I just said to him, you should put your hat in the ring for that job. And he's like, what? And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, oh, okay. So he did and he got it. Yeah. So that was, yeah, 2009, maybe 10. Um, yeah, 10. And, um, yeah, then we found out we were pregnant the same time we found out <laughs> we were going to Hong Kong. Wow. It's like, oh, my God, this is a double whammy for, like, someone who's this career girl. and Everything's moving so oh, fast. Oh, yeah. So here we are rocking up to Hong Kong. Wow. And what, what was that like, you know, the – because, again, you've done the New Zealand, you've been all around Australia. It was – Then moving to yeah. Hong Kong, what was that like? So different. I mean, looking back in hindsight, it is such a westernised country, but – then, for me, it was such a culture shock. Mm. You know, I'd been once to Hong Kong um, many years before, but just for a few days. So I didn't really know what it was like. I mean, I don't even think I knew it was sort of technically part of China. I was very ignorant to all of that. And um, But it was sort of amazing. I remember just we were stayed in the hotel room at the W, so we lived there for about six weeks. And I just look out the window and just these swarms of people, just the crowds were intense and just the different smells and the food and obviously the language, even though a lot of people spoke English, it was there were was a lot of Cantonese as well. And obviously we didn't I couldn't drive, so we would have to get taxis everywhere and they were just crazy. You know, they drive like with one foot on the brake, one foot on the accelerator, stopping and starting, and they don't speak English and it was just sort of so chaotic, but also at the same time intoxicating to be there. Yeah. Um, it was a bit scary. I mean, it was daunting for me because obviously James went into this new role as number two at the W and 
here I was at home yeah. pregnant. And I remember there were times just thinking, what am I doing? You know, who am I? And I think I did, I did write about this a book, bit in the book that I did sort of lose my identity or, or just not, I wasn't sure what my place was anymore. I'm going to be a mum in a foreign country, no family and no, no, no job, no and, friends, yeah. no house, no pet, no car. So it was quite, yeah, it was hard for a while. Mm, yeah. I remember times like James would have to stay late at work and I'd be like, what about me? You know, yeah. and you, I couldn't even have a glass of wine, you yeah. know, it was kind of tricky. So it took a while and I used to go back home quite a lot. Um, and then I had Ava probably three or four months into being there. So it was a different experience of Hong Kong. You know, a lot of people go there and all the expats there in Soho, living it up, staying yeah. out late, living that great life. And I couldn't really do that. So um, I had to join a mother's group. <laughs> And that was one thing I'm like, I'm never going to join a mother's group. It's just not me. Yeah. Um, but I did. It was all these mums that were pregnant at the same time. So we would all be having our babies at the same yeah. time. And we were just walking along, like trying to find this place in the middle of Hong Kong, you know, out here sweating because it's so humid, mm -hmm. like in the summer. Couldn't find it. All these foreign, you know, neon lights in Cantonese. And I just like, where is it? Mm -hmm. Walking in and then there's this table of sort of all similar women with bellies and the waiter's like, I think you're over yeah. there. <laughs> the right like, oh, yeah, that's me. Okay. <laughs> and there was just all these women from different countries, some local but mostly from expats from mm -hmm. America, from Netherlands, from England, from wherever. Mm. So, and, you know, you, I worked out you really just need one friend to get you through and I, I ended up meeting some really good friends th mm. through that group and, you know, you have you need one friend to have a cocktail or a coffee and I think that's you know, helps you to get through that those early days. Yep. Um, yeah, and so we ended up staying for four years. And, and how did you guys go? Because you've been together a relatively short period of yeah. time. Yeah. A little one on the way. I know with a lot of expat couples – you know when um you know sometimes the, the the one of the one of them will have a job yeah so yeah and the other one that even if they don't have a, a little one on the way but that network that staying at home you know there, there can be resentment yeah so, of you, course and you you, you know you're the, technically the trailing spouse which i hate yeah. that word but that's what you sort of are seen to be and suddenly no one's you know, and because I'd had quite a strong identity as a newsreader, mm -hmm. you know, and there, there is an ego with that, of course, because you're on camera and people know you and the respect and suddenly you're nothing, mm. you know, and you've got to work out, well, who am I without that auto cue and the hairspray and all of that? You know, what am I? You know, and it took a long time to work out what I was capable of. And, yeah, there were times when I would, James and I would argue, we probably had the worst arguments then mm. we've ever had because I was so I would get resentful you know and he was kind of lost and didn't really know what to do because I'd pushed for that move but at the same time yeah it's like you know so I really had but you know you have to be on the same page and we always have communicated and talked and we always made sure we felt the same way the whole way through and I think that's what got us through and also just having a sense of humor yeah that's the biggest thing, just having being able to laugh, you know, or you cry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's kind of what got us through, I think. And eventually I remember a friend in Hong Kong said, you know, she knew me from earlier days and she said, you're not just a newsreader. You've got like 20 years of media experience mm -hmm. under your belt. So I had to really think, okay, so that's like producing and writing and communication and tra media training and all of that. So I had to really pair it back, I guess, to what it – took to become that newsreader mm -hmm. and what you forget what those skills are. You just yeah. think, well, I just sit here and I know how to read the auto cue and I know how to research and I know how to talk and interview people. And you forget what it took to become that person. Mm -hmm. So I had to really think about that and, you know, then sort of branch out and I started writing articles for free to local websites like parenting websites mm -hmm. and all of that. Um, and then someone said, oh, would you like to do an MC gig? And they assumed because I had been a newsreader, I could MC. I'm like, oh, sure. <laughs> had no idea what I was doing. But Ava was nine weeks old. So I thought, okay, I've got to do I knew I had to do it, just do something for me. So I had to find this evening dress. And I was probably about two or three sizes bigger, which was a bit weird, and breastfeeding and breast pads in. And off I went to this thing, leave Ava with a babysitter. Actually, her grandparents were out from England. So I left her with them probably the first time I'd done that. And off I went and then I'm up on stage and suddenly I'm having to 
MC this event and read out all these awards, um, which was really nerve wracking. It was like going back to reading the news the mm-hmm. first time. I was kind of really stressed about it, but I must have done okay because um, they asked me back for like 10 years. And this yeah. last year was the only year I haven't been because of COVID, yeah. Yeah. even when I, we moved to China. And then we moved back to Australia and I was like, there's no way they're going to get me back now. Um, but they still got me back. They're a wonderful like Filipino family that mm-hmm. have made this company there. So so that was my first sort of foray into doing something freelance. But for me, like the old me was back, you yeah. know. And how did that feel? Having good. Something, like, owning yeah. something so yourself. good. Even yeah. though maybe it wasn't the most amazing job, it was it felt good. And yeah. that gave me that confidence, I guess, just to do more. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I did some media training then and I did um what else did I do? Some just presenting some business, you know, for big companies, some of their show reels and stuff like that. So it all kind of started coming together. But I mean, I couldn't do a lot, obviously, because I had Ava and, and she did, never slept. <laughs> so I was basically <laughs> tired 24 seven for four years. But um, she, I, you know, they have helpers in Hong Kong and I, that's a whole nother story, but I didn't want to have a helper. A lot of people have them living in their houses, but the places in Hong Kong are tiny. Mm-hmm. And sometimes there was a little, what they called a maid's room off our tiny kitchen like this, um, you know, it would have been as big as this table maybe with a shower, but we use that as a storage room. And I'm like, <laughs> I didn't want someone living in the house. I thought that's just a bit strange for me. And because James and I were so close as well, I thought that would just be a bit weird. Um, so, uh, we, we got a part-time helper, Ming, and she was Filipino. And, she, you know, they earn more as helpers in Hong Kong mm. than they do in their own country as um, qualified doctors, nurses, no computer. Else. She was um, had a degree in computer <coughs> science. But she could earn more um, as a helper in Hong Kong mm. in a week or a month. And they send all that money back. Her daughter was back in the Philippines. She was only maybe two or three when I first met Ming. And so she'd left her daughter there with her sister mm. And family, and they all brought up the kids, and all the women came out to Hong Kong to earn the money. The men sort of bring up the children as well in yep. the Philippines, and so she was out there making money, and she sort of became part of the family because she ended up coming two or three times a week, and she knew Ava from a baby, and um, you know it was amazing. But a- another fascinating story about mm. the helpers in Hong Kong, you yeah. know, um, yeah. But that enabled me to having her and allowed me to go and do more writing and I started my blog um, because I realised two years in living this crazy, amazing life, I really need to start writing about it. And I think writing for websites had given me a bit more confidence. Even though I was a journalist, I'd never really written long-form things like mm-hmm. that, just short, you know, um, news stories, what, why, when, how, who, where kind of thing. Yep. So it was very different. Um, but it, And I probably would never have done that in Australia either because you kind of pigeonholed into what yep. you are. You know, you're a newsreader. That's what you do. You don't be writing stories or things, you know. Yeah, yeah. So I had the confidence in another country to be someone that I wanted to be. Yeah, yeah. kind of reinventing yourself. Hmm. So tell us about your blog. Yeah, so that's Mint Mocker Musings. Um, strange name. But <laughs> Sorry, can you spell it again? Mint Mocker Musings. So um, – it's probably baby brain came up with that name, but I was having like um, <laughs> down in Starbucks. They, I mean, Starbucks is massive in Asia. There's one on every corner. And I, the whole pregnancy would go and have these mint mockers and they were amazing. So I couldn't really function without one. So yeah. that's the name, Mint Mocker Musings began. Fuel, yeah. yeah. So I just started writing about life in Hong Kong, mm-hmm. you know, and just different. It kind of wanted to be, uh, educationally entertaining. Yeah. So kind of teach people a bit about what it was like but also be a bit funny about it and, and fun, you know. Um, yeah, so I kind of blogged once a fortnight. I guess I would put something out or once a week, once a month sometimes and built up a bit of a following with that and, yeah, and kind of started monetizing it, which is how I met John with OFX. Um, yeah, so – it went really well and yeah. it's still going today, but of course I don't have as many exciting things to say <laughs> in Australia, but I, I, you know, I probably could, I should write more, but I've just obviously been caught up with the book and stuff, but mm-hmm. yeah, it's still, it's, I think I've written over, I don't know, two or 300 posts, yeah, maybe wow. 500. I don't know. There's a lot of stuff about Hong Kong and China and being an expat and reinventing yourself and being a mum and all of that stuff. Yeah. And so, obviously, Ava, uh, Ava is known around the world now. Does she know that she's on these blogs? And she does. <laughs> she does. She thinks it's quite good. I think she she hasn't read the book or anything like that. But I think when she's older, 
might be quite good because obviously she doesn't remember a lot about Hong Kong yeah. because we left there when she was three and a half. So she remembers China, Xi'an more. Yeah. So, and, um, but yeah, she's a honky girl, as we said earlier. Yeah. So she tells everyone she's from Hong Kong and they look at me like, what? Yeah. You know, it's fair blonde hair little girl. But yeah, life was, you know, when we came back to Australia, everyone used to say to me, she was six and a half and they would say, oh, you must be so happy that, you know, Ava's back to her normality, her new, her normal. And I'd be like, this is so not normal for her. Like yeah. all she knows is Asia, yeah. you know, her favourite food, are dumplings and rice and she uses chopsticks, you know. Yeah. So um, it took her a while to settle back as well, yeah. you know, yeah. all of us. Mm. So what's the motivation for the book? What was the motivation? Probably the same as writing a blog. I probably mm-hmm. always wanted to write a book and I think all journos think we've got a book in us. <laughs> it's a bit cliched, but yeah. um I wanted to write a book and I knew the minute we stepped on Chinese soil that yeah. that would be the book because it was so different and unusual and, you know, I knew there was a story to tell. So the minute I got there really, I started just researching and writing bits yeah. and pieces. I didn't had no clue how to write a book. I just would write these long blog posts really yeah. in the hope of somehow making it into a book one day. Mm-hmm. So that's how it all started, yeah. yeah. Why the China Blonde? The name? Yeah. Because someone else thought it up and it sounded really good. <laughs> I had, you know, I had lots of names going on in my head, but none really connected mm. with me. And it wasn't until I was in Australia and I'd been doing all these writing courses and I had a writer's group and we'd meet once a fortnight and critique each other's work. And um, one of the ladies there said she was writing a bit about China, but from a different angle, her mum was born there. So or lived there when she was young. So she had some chapters called Shanghai Rose and something else. And she said, oh, yours would have to be China Blonde, wouldn't it? I was like, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that, that's, that's it. That's right. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> even the publishers that rejected me always said they liked the name. Yeah. So I'm like, there you go. Yeah. I read this um, little excerpt in the AFR. Oh, yeah. you were yeah. talking about learning the language. Um, and one of the first things you learned was don't touch her. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to walk us through that? I oh, thought that was quite God. funny. Oh, God. Yeah, well, that was. We need to unpack that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because we, um, so we got the job in Xi'an because ja- we, James needed to get his first general manager role because he was number two at the W. So we kind of knew we had to leave Hong Kong, even though we really weren't ready and we loved it and we could have stayed there forever. The time was coming. So we kind of, he put his hand up for lots of jobs all over the place. You know, there was Seoul, Bangkok, um, India, Thai, you know, Thailand, Malaysia, all of these places, but they would sort of come up and then some, he would get down to the last two or the hotel would suddenly be put back a couple of years. It just didn't happen, but China kept coming up mm-hmm. because I think that year they were building 80 hotels just under the Starwood umbrella. It was phenomenal. Wow. So we kind of knew China wasn't going anywhere, but we were trying to avoid it for a while. <laughs> and we got offered a job in Wuhan. Yeah. Um, we went up there because you have to make a decision really quickly in hotels. They're like, can you tell us by Monday? It's Friday. And we'll be like, shit, how, what? Whoa. So Wuhan, and we knew nothing about Wuhan. I don't think the world knew anything about Wuhan back I then. Do now. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so I said, we've got to go. Well, James said we should go for the weekend. So we flew up. I think it was only an hour or two from Hong Kong. But, you know, that hour or two, there's a huge difference. You know, it's like crossing the Great Divide from Hong Kong into the mainland. Yeah. Suddenly there's no English. Suddenly all the signs have just the characters. No, because in Hong Kong they would often have English, English underneath. Yeah. Um, it's just so foreign to what I knew. Mm. Um, even though I had been to China, I'd been to Shanghai, and that was pretty crazy compared to Hong Kong. Um, this was another level. And so we sort of spent the weekend there. And the hotel was beautiful. It was a Western. and mm-hmm. But I remember we just sort of our hearts sank because, I mean, looking back, it was probably no different to Xi'an, but it just seemed, you know, there was pollution that day and that sort of reached to the ground, this big grey sort of cloud hanging over. Um, there were no Westerners in sight, um, just very different. No, That's intimidating. It was very intimidating and I, we just said, look, I don't think we're ready. Mm-hmm. So we said no, but we were very aware that we were reaching our the bottom of all our nose and we had to say yes to something. Mm-hmm. And Xi'an came up one day and I remember Googling it and thinking, well, it looks quite attractive as Mm -hmm. far as Chinese cities go. There were lots of red lanterns and really 
old beautiful architecture because it used to be the capital of China um, for 13 dynasties back in the day. So I just said to James, we've got to do it. You know, it's now or never. Yeah. We're just going to keep going around in circles and they're going to get sick of you and you have to get this GM role under yeah. your belt. So let's just go. And I was selfishly thinking, well, it might be a good book, <laughs> you yeah. know. So the off content. we think went. Of yeah, think of the content. The journal <laughs> in me was like, yeah, do it. And I wanted to kind of push myself as yeah. well and see how far I could go yeah. and if yeah. I could take it really. Um, if, it seems like you're quite comfortable being uncomfortable. I think I, yeah, I think I've worked that out about me. I kind mm. of, I'm weird. Like I sort of very much love being in my comfort zone, but I like s- stepping out of it mm. yeah. and seeing what Exciting, happens. Yeah. I like yeah. that adventure, yeah, I yeah. think. Yeah, I always wanted an exciting life and I guess that's kind of part of it for mm. me. Yeah. So then we, James went out before us and then we arrived in Xi'an and I was just like, what was I thinking? What mm. have I done? Yeah. It was just my heart sank. I don't think I could speak. I was just speechless for probably a couple of months because, again, there was no Westerners, no one, all Chinese, all no one spoke English. Uh, you know, I remember taking over outside the first morning and we sort of tentatively stepped outside this hotel, which was beautiful, um, and there was a big pagoda opposite, 1,300-year-old pagoda that the Buddhists used to bring their um, – I forget what they're called, Sanskrits, I think. They would bring them and house them there for, along the Silk Road. So that was a popular tourist feature and there were tourists from all over China. So it meant that I didn't realise, but there were Chinese people from even more remote villages like yeah. this, that have never, ever seen a white person in their lives. So when Ava and I stepped out, both blonde, they were just like, oh, my God. Like they were just fascinated, just looking at us like – wow, you know, you could see them and they all stop and they would just crowd around us and especially Ava, just they were just, I don't know, and they would come sort of gather around us and all be taking photos of us and trying to touch Ava and trying to touch her hair and obviously they were all saying things in Chinese but I had no idea what they were saying. Um, So I didn't know. They would say Pia Liang, which was beautiful or, you know, things like that, but I didn't know that then. I'd started having a few lessons but... And I'd just be smiling and, you know, I don't know. And then uh, what the clincher was when an, an old toothless man picked her up and sort of hoisted her above his shoulders. And I immediately was frantic. Yeah. I'm like, are they going to steal her? What are they going to do? You know, and I kind of trying to grab her and everyone's sort of laughing and gathering around and clapping and Ava's like peeing her pants, like get yeah. me down from here, screaming. And I was sort of shouting, don't put her down, you know, Um you know, it's har- it was harmless looking back, yeah. but I didn't know that. That is so weird. Mm. I mean, you know, it was just the fact that they were so amazed and they yeah. were so impressed and happy, And but I didn't ha- – of course, you don't know that when it's a different culture. So I remember, yeah, I walked back into the hotel and I'm like, you know, I need a Chinese teacher right here now, pronto. <laughs> um, first thing, don't touch her. Dong bie – what is it? Dong bie ta. Bie dong ta. Bie dong ta. I needed to learn that straight away and – you know, um, so I found there was another one other Westerner working in the hotel and he was fluent. I said, well, whoever's teaching you, I need her. And her name was Vera Wang. Yeah. So she came along to the hotel. <laughs> the and dresses in her spare yeah, time. Yeah, <laughs> I wish. So we did it, yeah, we did every week for two and a half years. Yeah. We, I studied Chinese. Which and did you pick you picked it up? I did. I, I, I will never say I was fluent and I wasn't even very good, but I could have a conversation in the end. Yeah. You know, I could chat to somebody and, and, you know, if I went out in the streets and my phone battery died, I wouldn't have a heart attack. I knew that I could get back to my hotel. I could call, get a taxi. I could do something. I could ask somebody. So mm. I knew enough to get by. Yeah. Um, yeah. So when you are when you were walking around your new home in, in China, were you always kind of documenting stuff and do you have a notepad? Like what was the process of I of used to write phone? a lot of <laughs> notes in my phone um, just always just writing things and just snapping pictures everywhere yeah. to sort of remind me, which mm-hmm. helped me a lot later in writing the book. I remember going back and just pouring over all of those images because when you're writing it, you've got to remember and try and put people in that space that mm-hmm. you were in and make them feel like you were. Mm-hmm. So I had to really put myself back into that photo and just remember everything about it, mm-hmm. how I felt, what I, you know, what I was thinking, what the people, what everyone looked like, what the air was like, what the smell was like you know, really put yourself back in that place. Yeah. yeah. Which is completely different to your journalism days. Oh, where, so said, different. The, oh, my quick, God. Snappy. Yeah. Mm. You know, you write to pictures and that's yeah. how you do it. You know, you have a look at what your pictures are and you write a few words to it. And, 
you know, it's the facts, the yeah. bare facts, and that's it. Um, so this had to be so much colour and creativity, and so it took quite a while to learn how to do that. Mm. <laughs> so what were some of the other kind of cultural nuances about living in – were there any kind of preconceptions about living in China that you thought, oh, this is – this is on point or this isn't what I thought Yeah, I think or? I wanted to, from the very start, I wanted to find out what the real Chinese people were like because, and sort of tell their story a bit too mm-hmm. because I think we all just hear on the news all the time about the, the economies, like the second biggest economy in the world. They're this powerhouse. They're a force to be reckoned with. You know, they're going to take over the world. And now, of course, with COVID, it's all about what's China like and who are these people. And whenever we would see them, they were, you know, if you see them coming out in their tour groups, there was always bad things written about them because they're, you know, the, they're used to it's survival of the fittest over there. You know, most people live in poverty, even though they're one of the, they have the most um, number of rich people in the mm. world. There's a huge, you know, there's, what is it, 1.4 billion people. And so many of them are living just below the poverty line. Mm. So, you know, you'll see a Ferrari parked next to a three-wheeler bicycle with, a, you know, four people on the back of yeah. it. And and they're, and they're just starting to have a middle class when I was there. That was just coming in. So suddenly they had all this new money and they really didn't know what to do with it because for the, most of the time China had been so busy trying to build this country up from the ground and bring people out of poverty that there was never much guidance on behaviour or anything like that. I mean, the greeting that people used to use was, Chilama, have you eaten? And that was how because, you know, a lot of them hadn't. Mm. So that was, I wanted to really dig deep into that. And I interviewed so many Chinese with a translator most of the time, just to see how they felt about China as well, because we always hear about the Communist Party Mm. as well, and, you know, censorship and all of that. And that's all very real. Um, But most Chinese people really don't care about that. They don't, they don't talk about politics like we do in the West. They don't sit around over dinner and talk about what Scott Morrison's doing or Gladys and, you know, um, because they're just happy that the government's put a roof over their heads. Um, They don't, you know, they might seem like they are brainwashed and potentially they are from very young because that's all, you know, education is huge and it's all about the Chinese. They're just so patriotic because they are taught to be Mm. and they don't think otherwise. Um, So it's quite fascinating to just hear how they feel about it. You know, when you point out censorship, a lot of times for me, the TV would cut to black. You know, if we're watching CNN and a story came up about Hong Kong, for example, they've got Bureau of Censorship that would just cut that off so that you don't see that. But you would, and of course, all the papers are painted um, in favour of the Communist Party always, how good a job they're doing and what they've done. You know, there's never a bad you know, word against them. Yeah. But they don't really care about that. You know, you ask them. I mean, of course, the new younger generations are beginning to and that's coming through, but those older generations or from 30, 35 and upwards, you know, they're just happy to have a roof over their heads and be making money and have their family. And they're like, oh, we know we've got censorship, but, you know, it is what it is and, you know, you have censorship in different ways in the West. Um, They're like, look at democracy and Donald Trump, you know, for example. So they don't see that democracy is something they, def- you know, desperately want mm. after seeing that. Um, so, yeah, I tried to kind of paint that picture in the book and talk about, you know, I interviewed some chi- a Chinese man that had been in the war and World War Two, and, you know, I had young Chinese people and my hairdresser was a young Chinese bloke and he was just hilarious and, <laughs> you know, we became really good friends as much as you can with someone that doesn't speak your language very well. <laughs> and you see, I used to go every week for a blow dry and it was kind of the highlight, you know, because I the first time I went it was awful and, you know, I couldn't get my hair coloured there or anything because I'd never coloured a blonde woman's hair. Yeah. So they did do it, but it was kind of orange. <laughs> so I, um, it was just kind of one of those love-hate things. I'd mm. go there, but we eventually got to work each other out and sense of humour yeah. kind of came through even though we couldn't really speak to each other properly. Mm-hmm. So I just wanted to talk about them as well in the book as well as my own personal story of living in this culture that I knew nothing about and dealing with it and coming to – you know, really respect it for what it is and who they are and that they are really a nation steeped in so much history and that plays such a big role in who they are today. Yeah. And there's so many of them that, of course, it's always been just push each other out of the way or you never get anywhere, yeah. you know. Like we'd go into Ikea and when Ikea opened up, that was a really big deal because it was the first kind of Western furniture place. Yeah. And I remember James and I going, we've got to go and see this because it would we'd feel at home in yeah. there and I want to see what they think of it. 
And we walked in and they were just everywhere, like sleeping on the beds, sitting in the big comfy chairs. They were one we walked past one of those like an amusement park. Yeah, it was yeah. like a theme park and a day out for them, you know. <laughs> they um there was like a table with tags hanging off it and the chairs and a couple of girls had sat down and they bought their own lunch. They were just having lunch at the table, you know. <laughs> in just Ikea. Yeah, in Ikea. <laughs> That's great. And there's people in the bath, makeshift bathrooms doing their makeup. Some people are feeding the babies. Uh, you know, it's just in, and where the toy part was, they're all just on the floor playing and they obviously looked at us, why Guaren, the white people. But why are you just standing there, you know? why? Because there's all many, many people on one bed. Yeah. Some are lying down and partners patting her head. It's just, it was crazy. <laughs> so, you know, but uh, for a lot of them, you realise that being, that was far more um, pleasurable than being in their own homes because there's many families under one roof because it's very big. You must look after your elderly parents um, and they're very tiny houses. And so to be out in this big sort of department store with air conditioning and everything's new and shiny. Would have been beautiful mm. for them. Yeah. yeah. So. Wow. How did um, how did Ava go? You know, obviously learning, you know, being educated. She, yeah, she went really well. She went to an international school. There were only two there. Um, when I say international, in the loosest sense of the word, because it had mostly South Koreans, because uh, the Samsung factory and a lot of those big fat Boeing and all of that were there in Xi'an. So Xi'an was a city of 9 million, but it still felt like it was the 70s, you know, like you'd gone back in time a lot. Yeah. Um, you know, people smoking everywhere and out inside, outside, and just like going back in time. But um, 9 million people, but still just a handful of expats, mm. but a lot of South Koreans for those big factories that were there. Um, and so there was a lot of those uh, South Koreans at her school, a few Chinese, but you could only go there if you had a green card as a Chinese local. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't want to put her into a local school just purely because I thought that would be too much immersion because there would be no English at all. And I thought about it, but then also they just have such a different way of doing education. You know, it's from very early in the morning till very late at night. They have a rest in the middle of the day and they do homework for several hours a night as young as five. So it's cutthroat. You know, yeah. their, their whole life is geared towards education and getting into university and then getting a job um, and then getting married, <laughs> you know, so, but it's all about that. Um, so she went to this international school and there were a few Western kids there and that's how I met most of my friends with the teachers that had come to teach at the mm-hmm. school. Um, and for she was three and a half and they wanted her to go five days a week, even so, nine to three. But I used to pick her up at lunchtime because I thought that's just too much. Mm. So I'd pick her up for about six months to a year and then I started going a bit longer and that's when I sort of met other parents picking up their kids and stuff. Um, But we would have to do like an hour and a half drive with a chauffeur (laughs) to school. It sounds all glamorous. It was in a limousine, beautiful, Um, but it was kind of the Chinese way, you know, that he – that there were four hotel drivers. We didn't have our own. We just had whoever one of the hotel drivers was free and they would wait for us at 20 to 8 each morning, you know, rain, snow, pollution, whatever it was, and um, it was just mayhem. We'd do this hour and a half drive through this traffic that was just bumper to bumper, every car going every which way. You know, there's no lanes, there's no um, indicators, it's just the horn to sort of say you're coming. So it's just this deafening sound that you just need a Panadol when you get to the end. It's constant horns. Um, It's just weaving in and out, beep, 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 bicycles, big buses barging their way through. And you just get to school be like, oh, my God, I made it. And then you'd get out and you couldn't even cross the road. There's no school zones or anything with 40Ks. It's like cars just flying by. So the lovely driver would get out and sort of stop the traffic like Superman for Ava to cross with me. And they sort of became good friends, some of them as well, you know, even again, couldn't speak English, but there was that unspoken, they would look after us. And there was one that, you know, I noticed he started getting to know some of the other drives at the school because I'd come out and he would be having a cigarette out the back on the, you know, but it was just hilarious. I remember bringing Ava out, I'd pick her up and we'd walk out and he'd be snoozing. They'd always be sleeping wherever mm. they could. He'd have the chair, you know, reclined back and I'd have to sort of wave and get his attention. And then he'd just sort of drive and do a 10 point turn with the doors swinging open wildly. And we'd just be like, oh my God, <laughs> here he is, get in. And it was just funny you just have to laugh and it was fun but I would spend most of my day two hours getting there and back and then two hours to pick her up you know wow that's a big portion of the day Mm -hmm. so what are some of the cultural shocks that really stood uh stood out in China jeez it's just things like that I guess that you just 
you know, just the language barrier and the food was always, you know, it, it, the food is different in each sort of province in China, which I didn't realise. So the food in Hong Kong is very different to the sort of Chinese food that you would get in Xi'an. And they each have their sort of unique things. Like in Xi'an, it was like these big noodles that are really thick and, yeah. and everything's oily and spicy and, yeah. So, and I, it's just very different, you know. It's like whole, I'm all right, no, whole whole birds with heads on them and yeah. claws and, you know, they and eat everything. Is the Chinese food over there, or I suppose just food there, um, very different to the Chinese food? Oh, there? yeah. Yeah. Is yeah. our food like completely It's ridiculous food? here. Yeah. It is. It's just like the sweet and sour sauce <laughs> and the honey chicken. Yeah. 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 You know, it's <laughs> nice, <laughs> but it's nothing like that. Yeah. It's nothing like that at all. I mean, I love, I that, I love the Cantonese food in Hong yeah. Kong. That's a lot of dim sum and things like that, yeah, which are favorite. really tasty. But they didn't really have that in Xi'an. It was more just... Mm, I, I'd have to show you a picture, but it's just, it was really, was I didn't thing. eat a lot of it. Yeah. And we were, I mean, I was privileged, of course. I lived in the hotel and we could order room service. So I could get some things like I could get salmon because they would order it in. Um, I mean, they used to think we ate the weirdest things, I'm sure. Always I would ring up on room service and they'd go, uh, broccoli, salmon, you, which was salmon, and rice. And I'd be like, yep, they knew that's what I ordered every time. Yeah. <laughs> And um, so yeah, hamburger joints. There was one that opened up in the end, so that was good. And because China changes so rapidly, I mean, shopping centres had been knocked down one day, and something new the next. So I, you know, I could tell you that there was a great restaurant there when I was there, and it's probably not there now because China is just changing so rapidly. It's crazy, you know. Um, there's a, I, there's a lot of ghost towns in China. Like yeah. there's just these massive high rises, and I, they were there were so many on the way to the airport. Just huge high rises, rows after rows after rows of these concrete towers, but no one in them. But they're sort of waiting for the future. They build them to wait for the people to come almost. Okay. Um, and there yeah. and there are whole. I've heard there are whole cities. Yeah, you I've know, seen on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. It's abandoned cities. And I think a Crazy. lot of people don't realize that there are something like six hundred and sixty cities in China, and most of them have well over a million people. You know, there's just so many people and so many cities that you would never even hear of or mm. get to. Um, and then so many remote villages, even though they're trying to bring urbanisation, move all of those people out, which is another thing I learned, that a lot of those people in Xi'an, the ones, I guess, what shocked me initially walking out was that people just spit everywhere, mm -hmm. just, you what? know clear their throat and just do a big hoik. So there's kind of spit all over the pavement. Ooh, and you kind gross. of, you know, our reaction, of course, as a Westerner is like, oh, what are you doing? And I used to just sort of shake my head at them. But I realised later, why am I, you know, why am I shaking my head at them? Because they don't know why I'm shaking my head because to them it's better out than in yep. and that is what they've been taught. And they look at us and go, well, you blow your nose into a tissue and put it in your pocket. Like, that's pretty gross, you know. So <laughs> it's, fair. It's, it's fair, isn't it? So, I mean, those things shocked me at first. And also, like, the little children, I remember the first couple of days, they would have um, nappies or pants, but they would have a big split in the back so that they could just go to the toilet easily. Right. So you didn't have to wear a nappy and take it off. Um, and I would see lot like they, a lot of them. They all squat. They're very good at squatting on the ground. So they can just, if they were having a conversation, they're very good at just squatting, almost sitting on their bum, but not yeah. quite easily. But and so they would all just be sitting around smoking and talking on the streets like that. And then they might just let their daughter just go to the toilet in the gutter there, or just you know in front of people. They wouldn't even if there was a big shopping center and you knew there would be toilets in there. So that was kind of jarring at first, mm. you know, but, but I later realised a lot of these young children are with their grandparents um, because they're brought up by their grandparents because there's not really daycares or anything like that. Mm. And also a lot of these older generations are from rural villages yep. and they've all been brought into the cities. So they're still coming to terms with what a city is. It's why they don't know, like <laughs> the little green man, when you push, you know, you think you can cross the road. That's not a thing in China. That green man goes, but people are crossing on red, green, nothing. You know, yeah. they're just crossing constantly all over the place. So cars and cars just keep coming. They don't stop. So you have to learn to weave in and out, but they're going slow. So it's unlikely you'll get run over. Yeah. But it's just, and at first it's so daunting. Like I would stand 
on the road, on the pavement, thinking, I don't think I'm ever going to get across here. Yeah. What am I going to do? I'm just stuck. You I'm stuck here forever now. And I heard some you, you, people when I'd been there a couple of years and was used to it, I'd heard this American guy overheard him saying, I think we could get killed crossing the roads. I thought, <laughs> you know what? You probably could because it's yeah. so, because they just, yeah, and I realised that's because, you know, as I said, they're all from villages where mm. they don't have light crossings or anything like that. And, yeah, so you just. Yeah, like I said, it's just crazy out there at first. And, you know, it just suddenly though, eventually after two years, you don't bat an eyelid. You suddenly realise, you know, I walk out of the hotel and I see a lady get out of a car with a cigarette and a fur coat and her little girl just squats over the gutter and does a wee and you just walk by, you know, yeah. and I think, God, this is becoming normal now. <laughs> this <laughs> is what's happened. I it. have, yeah. yeah. So how long did it take then to, to, to make that adjustment in China? Because you were there four years. No, two and a half two in, old, sorry. Uh, sorry, in Xi'an, yeah. Right. I think uh, <laughs> maybe 18 months, I don't know. Right. The last year I really felt like I was kind of hitting my stride. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. know, I guess language-wise I had a good group of friends that I'd met. Um we felt comfortable going outside. You didn't feel like kind of intimidated and scared, you know, or you would just, and it was always very safe there as well. Like you could walk past a group of men and I would feel quite intimidated in Sydney and they, you know, they just walk past. They're just, it's quite safe yeah. to kind of roam the streets on your own. Um, some people might disagree and I think it depends where you are and, mm. you know, that sort of thing. But in Xi'an it was at the time. Um, but, yeah, I think about 18 months in I just kind of felt okay. I mean, we still had to sort of escape every few months and we would go to Malaysia or just somewhere for a few weeks just to get away mm. from it um, because it does send you a bit crazy. And I think for James especially, you know, a staff of 450, but, but you know, while they could speak a bit of English, you could never get past that mm. surface stuff. Well, things would just get so lost. You know, he'd sit around the table with all of his staff in a meeting and, really come out no, none the wiser yeah. <laughs> for what really happened, you know. And, uh, you know, it's hard. I think it was really tough for him in that role yeah. um, just knowing what was going on in the hotel yeah. half the time, yeah. you know, and people would translate for him, but were they actually translating yeah. correctly, you know. Um, That's so, that censorship. Yeah. <laughs> someone said once that when they did translate for him, there was none of the empathy that he had portrayed, you know, in his speech. So, and you really don't know because you can't speak the language that mm. as well as that, you know. Um, Go, going back on the sens the censorship side of things, how did you like as an expat? I know that my my friends and family um, get a lot of comfort from looking at Facebook and stuff and just seeing what we're up to, and we're we're pretty active yeah. on the social channels, and and we we keep connected that way, especially with my nieces and nephews back back home. I mean, how did you keep in contact with your friends and family? Yeah, um, I could get on Facebook, and um, but you had to have a VPN, um, and yeah, so you had to. We paid for a VPN, mm. so anything I wanted to do, you would have to go in and get that up first, and then I could. But the internet was really patchy, so it was really hard. Like if we wanted to watch Netflix, things would just stop and just yeah. you know all the time, um, and I could. So I had to use a VPN for my own blog because that wasn't available in China. Mm -hmm. um, for my own, yeah, for anything like Twitter, YouTube. Yeah. Um, WhatsApp was okay then, but I've been told that's since been banned as well. Because mm -hmm. they have WeChat over there. WeChat, WeChat. and everything's right. done on WeChat. Yeah. Emails, they don't really WeChat email each other. Yeah. yeah, they don't email each other at all. James would be like, I've got about 40, 50, 100 WeChats in here yeah. from staff members, but you're trying to find them, you know, but it's their <laughs> life saviour. And now, of course, yeah, you pay everything on it. Yeah. Um, when I was there, I still used cash a lot because I couldn't use any of my credit cards there. Mm -hmm. So I would just walk around with all these Big Chinese wads. no wads of cash. <laughs> but now I'm told it's just a re it's really a cashless society yeah. now. Yeah, completely. And that's another w way that it's just changed overnight. Mm -hmm you know, their technology and the way they, they can get something done, which I guess is what we saw in Wuhan when they made that hospital. That hospital yeah. yeah, and people go, wow. But I was like, I'm not surprised because, A, it's because of the communist government because they can move in and get everybody doing what they want to do, mm. um, whether that's a good thing or not. Yeah. But um, it's <laughs> kind of not the point. They get yeah. things done because there's no other party to fight with and say, no, we want it done this way or we want it done that way. Yeah. So it's very interesting, Yeah. yeah. I mean, even just hearing some of the things, the, the behaviours that I see from Chinese here in, in Australia, they now make sense. 
you know, mm. in terms of just crossing the road whenever. Yeah. Um, driving. Driving. You see a Chinese person, you're like, why are they not indicating? Why are they going yeah. across four lanes? Oh, that's but the same in Italy, though. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so it's yeah. like a with me when you're talking yeah. about horns and no indicator. I'm like, is this Napoli you're talking about? I remember that, yeah. I remember Greece was like that when yeah. I went to Athens. So yeah. I was like, whoa. And there's a donkey there. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. It's like, where am I? Yeah. yeah. And in your book, do you also kind of have some personal reflections as well? Mm. I mean, I've only read excerpts. I do, that, that yeah. The press, yeah, but- I do. I talk about um, – a lot about that thing I talked to you about, lost identity and finding yourself and reinvention. Mm. Um, and I talk about friendships a lot because I had a really great group of girlfriends there and we really had to lift each other up because mm. those are your people because you have no family. Mm. And if your husband or partner is working, you know, you've got to have someone. So we would text from morning till night because just to know you're not alone in this big city because mm. that's the one thing you need, I think, as an expat anywhere. Mm just to know that you've got someone else out there that's going through what you're going through. We might just have a coffee once a week, but you would just come away knowing that you had, you know, you had someone if you needed them and you become each other's doctors and because, you know, health, we couldn't really go get health care. We could, mm. but, you know, the, the only English-speaking doctor in the city of Nine Million really couldn't speak English so well. Yeah, yeah. I can imagine he would have been busy as well. <laughs> he was, it was funny. Like there was a few funny stories in the book about that as well, just going to visit him for certain things and just, you know, just very funny. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, so I talk a lot about those friendships and what makes us gravitate towards certain people because I guess you do become friends in other countries with people that you might not normally mm. be friends with. So, you know, you're friends from people that, from all walks of life, not just in your little niche in, say, in your newsroom or your office, you yeah. know. So what makes you become better friends with them? What makes you stick with them and not others? And, yeah, I found that quite interesting. And also, as you said, about the relationship with James and mm. keeping that on track when, you know, he was pretty stressed. I've never seen him so stressed as when we lived in China, um, especially the first few months. Um so just, you know, keeping on the same page and checking in with each other every few months, is this what we want to do? Are yeah. we still okay being here? You know, and you always have that question as an expat, when is it time to leave yeah. and where to next and what do we do? Yeah. So, yeah, just it was a lot about that personal side of things too. Yeah. So, yeah. And then how did that how did that conversation come up in terms of coming, coming back home to, to oh, Australia? Oh, God. Oh, well. Or is that the second book? No, well, it's sort of bond. it's sort of the end, yeah. It's the end of this because we sort of, again, we got to this point where we weren't ready to leave. Mm. You know, we were kind of enjoying it yeah. and, and had really got into the swing of how it was. And I guess like you said before about living life, mm. you know, even if I had some days where I didn't do anything, I still felt like I was having an adventure because yeah. I just have to look out the window and see how crazy it was. And for me that was – I liked that. So we were always concerned about coming back to Australia, just settling back in and being normal again. Is that because you kind of get addicted to Mm. that thing, life of not having normality. Um, But um, obviously time was, you can't stay there forever. And the pollution was really very bad in the winter. So we had to wear masks pretty much all winter. Um, and Ava would have to wear one in the playground and all of that, and she had quite bad bronchitis, and I did. So it wasn't good for our health. I mean, so I threw away my mask at the end thinking I'd never wear it again. (laughs) Little (laughs) did I know what the world was going to become. But, yeah, so we knew for our health we should probably not stay too long. Um, But where to? Do we go somewhere else in Asia? Um, I probably could have. We both probably could have actually. Yeah. But we also knew Ava was growing up and her grandparents were here. One sets in England, one's here. We needed – she should, probably should be near some of them at least. Yeah. Um, so – and then we were kind of humming and hiring still and then a job came up in Sydney. And, of course, Sydney was our home and it's hard to get back into Sydney. Yeah. We could have ended up anywhere um, in Australia. So I we kind of just didn't know what to do. And in the end we thought we've just got to take it and see what happens. Happy with the decision? Yeah, very happy. I mean, we've obviously settled back in and it it is so much easier. Mm. You come back and it's like, oh, my God, I can just go to the doctor or the hairdresser or the supermarket. I don't have to get my phone out and psych myself up before I go out the door. And for Ava, I mean, she's loving it and loves school and has settled in. I mean, it took a while when she first got back. There are a lot of tears, and I want to go back to China, Mum. You know, oh, um, oh, wow. yeah, yeah, which she wouldn't, and which was 
I had to sort of say to people because they were like, she must be so happy being here. And I'm like, well, it's very different, you know. Yeah. And just a lot of staring at the sky because it was so blue and so piercing. It's like everything's on high definition yeah. because it's always in a shroud of pollution over there. Even on a good day, it's a pale, pale blue grey. Yeah. So um, it's been great. Um, will we go overseas again? I think we probably will because mm. I think there's still that in us that there's mm. more to do. But, of course, that all depends what comes up. Schools, all of that sort of thing. But never say never. Yeah. yeah. So how are you keeping yourself busy now then? Well, I've kept busy the last few years doing the book. Yep. I've done a lot of freelance, um, you know, a bit of emceeing, a bit of writing articles and all that sort of thing. And then the book has taken so much time just – Writing a book is not mm. easy. You think you can just, you know, you've got to write it, then you've got to get it edited a mm. gazillion times and, you know, then you've got to find a publisher and that's not easy as well and then it's a very brutal <laughs> industry. Mm. Um, so you've got to really be persistent and stick yeah. with it. And then, of course, once it finally comes out, once you've done everything, you've got to promote it and do all of that. But now I'm also writing a second book, um, but that's fiction. Okay. Um based in Hong Kong. Yeah. Um, so Can you tell us a bit about it? Yeah, I don't know really yet, but it's going to be contemporary yeah, yeah. women's fiction, but yeah. kind of, a, you know, friendships and that mm-hmm. those themes that I really like. Um, so I've just started that. So, yeah, I've, yeah, I've got nice. to get into that. And I'll, you know, be doing a lot of keynote talks and things about living a life less ordinary and reinventing yourself and, um, you know, doing – what you really want to do in life yeah. and stepping out of your comfort zone, that you can do it at yeah. any age really. Um, it's possible. And and just, you know, that I've, I've realised, as you said earlier, I must be quite a persistent person. I've realised through all of this getting the book done that possibly I am. <laughs> <laughs> so I think there's a lot I can sort I sort of went to a speak, what do you call them, like um, a speaker's kind of um, coach and yeah. she sort of psychoanalysed me and she kind of got out of me what tips – what I do to get where I'm going, which I'd never really thought of my kind of the way that I do it. Mm. So, yeah, I think I can, you know, put that into a keynote and Mm. give some people some help maybe, try. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, I I, I think you've got a fabulous story both – personally you know as a as a journalist but also as a as a mother and and a, and a wife and now obviously an author i think and it all comes together so beautifully thanks um, i love the fact that you you kind of speak about reinventing yourself you know mid 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 30s as well and you know you've, you're living your dream 30s and, mid 40s can keep yeah. going mid 50s who <laughs> but, knows <laughs> well, I, just, I love that because i think some people one they pigeonhole themselves and, and two they are scared to try new things yeah. or they they live a life of um of, of other people's expectations yes yeah, um, and and it's exactly. actually okay to just move overseas. It's okay to try different things. It's okay to. Well, if it doesn't work, my mum always was great with this. She'd always say, "If it doesn't work, you can come home. Yeah. Mm. If you don't like it or the job doesn't work out, you can always quit. Yeah. You know, nothing's forever." Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's sort of what I had in mind when I went to Hong Kong, and I did. I made Sky News was amazing and kept my job open for a year. Mm. So I thought, well, I can always go back. Yeah. You know, and then two years in. I thought we'd probably go back, but you don't know what's going to happen, you know, and you might just love it. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah. You might just love it. And Nicole did love it. <laughs> um, we're going to wrap up with my question that I like to ask. Oh, God. You've what's got this? A, you've got a table book for four people. Oh, you can no. invite three guests for dinner. Who would they be and why? And they can be. How many guests? You're allowed three guests. Three. So you're going to have dinner with, with three other people. Who would they be and why? Um, Reese Witherspoon, um, because I, I like her as an actress, and I like the what she um, I like the movies that she's made, and she now has her own production company, and she has her own Sunshine Book Club, so she does a lot of amazing books. So I'd love to, and I've seen her interviewed, and I'd love to. I just she's so tenacious, and she's accomplished so much. I'd just like to hear her, her personal story. Yeah. Either Barack or Michelle Obama, because. They're incredible. Mm-hmm. And I've read Michelle's book and I loved it. So how could you not want to sit next to one of them over dinner? Absolutely. Third person, I don't know. I have to think about that. Wow. I don't know. James? Yeah. I was thinking when you said that, maybe James, because yeah. I'd need someone there to talk about it later yeah. and, you know, download what we – did you just hear what they said, you know? Oprah would be good. Yeah. Um, yeah. Have you seen the Michelle Obama doco on Netflix? Yes. That's, yeah, yeah, really good. Yeah. And now Barack's book's out, so I'd like to read that too. 
Fascinating. Okay. Well, on books, how can people get hold of your book? Where can they yeah. buy it? You can get that on my website um, if you would like a signed copy. So that's NicoleWebOnline.com. Yeah. Booktopia is selling it and all good bookstores. Oh, and Amazon has eBooks and hopefully a paperback soon. Awesome. Nice. Yeah. And we'll include a link in the, in yeah. the, to the podcast as well. Nicole, thank you for coming on Thank Telling you. Your Story. <laughs> Thank Amazing. you both for um, having look, me. Look forward to hearing a few of your keynotes. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. you. Awesome.